In reality, disruption always follows an S-curve, the first phase of which is exponential. And this is what we're seeing now. The global market for each of these three technologies shows a beautifully consistent exponential curve. Conventional forecasts get disruption wrong. Major industry forecasts have made simple linear projections for the growth of solar, for example, year after year for 20 years. Now at the same time that disruption creates a new system, it also wipes out the old system. And this isn't theoretical, it has already begun with coal in the United States. Year after year, these same industry forecasts have been desperately trying to save coal from collapse with wishful thinking. But coal in the United States has been disrupted first by fracking and now by solar and wind. Hey, I'm Steven and this is Solving the Money Problem. If you're new, welcome. If you're not, welcome back. So I hate to be so clickbaity and dramatic with the title of this video, but I'm serious. This is an urgent warning to investors, but also on the flip side, an enormous opportunity. So maybe you guys have heard of Kathy Wood of ARK Invest, you know, that crazy lady who had that crazy price target on Tesla stock that was completely crazy until it wasn't. So how is it that somebody who sounded so crazy turned out to be so correct? Simple. Kathy Wood and ARK Invest intimately understand disruptive innovation. We are on the cusp of a seismic disruption, the scope and scale of which the world and the stock market has never before seen. Trillions of dollars will be lost and trillions more will be made. My goal with this video is to steer you guys to make sure you're on the right side of this colossal change. Long term viewers of this channel will know I'm a big fan of Kathy Wood. I'm also a big fan of Tony Sieber. In fact, I'm a big fan of anyone who engages their big brain, thinks a little bit, reasons a little bit, infers a little bit, puts that on the record, and then turns out to be right when at the time they sounded completely mad. And that's exactly the point of this video. Tony Sieber is part of a think tank called Rethink X who've recently released an amazing report and to promote that report they've also published a video sharing some of the highlights and the insights. I put a link in the description to the full report and video, I highly recommend you guys check them out. But in this video, I'm just going to be taking some of the highlights and adding my thoughts and comments where I think it's relevant. The implications of this research are truly stunning and I urge all investors to make sure you're intimately familiar with this seismic disruption that's now taking place. So let's get into the video. But first, hey guys, if you live in the US and you'd like to help out the channel and get up to four free stocks, check out the link in the description to Weeble. If you open a new account, you'll get two free stocks between $2.50 and $250 each just for opening an account. And if you deposit $100, you'll get a further two free stocks valued between $8 and $1,600 each. That is an obnoxiously good return on your investment. I mean, really, deposit $100 and you'll end up with, at minimum, $21 worth of stocks, a 21% ROI on your money. And if you're in Australia, the UK, or New Zealand, you can get a free stock with stake also using the link in the description. Let's get back to it. Like others throughout history, this disruption is the result of a convergence of several key technologies. The costs of solar, wind, and batteries have been improving relentlessly for several decades, and now incumbent coal, gas, and nuclear power technologies can no longer compete. This makes the disruption inevitable because of economic forces alone. The disruption won't happen everywhere at exactly the same time, but for those regions that choose to lead the disruption, a 100% solar, wind, and battery system is possible as soon as 2030. Conventional coal, gas, nuclear, and other power generation assets will be stranded by the disruption. And so no new investments in these technologies is rational from this point forward. In all technology disruptions, cost is the fundamental driving force. Just since 2010, the cost of solar PV has fallen 82% or an average of nearly 16% per year. We project that it will continue to improve at 12% per year during the 2020s, and so by 2030, solar will be more than 70% cheaper than it is today. The consistency is easier to see when the same data are viewed on a logarithmic chart, and it's precisely this consistency that makes these trends so predictable. In just two decades, the cost of solar will have improved by a factor of 20. Wind cost improvements are also substantial, 46% since 2010. That's an average of almost 6% per year. And we project 5.5% per year during the 2020s for another 43% by the end of the decade, a 3x improvement in 20 years. 
Lithium ion batteries are even more impressive. 87% since 2010, averaging nearly 20% per year. And we project 15% improvement during the 2020s, totaling another 80% by 2030 for an astounding 45X improvement in two decades. Now, I just wanna take a pause here to let the implications of this sink in. We can see costs of solar, wind, and batteries are declining predictably. The key word here, predictably over time. All right, guys, now let's play along here. Let's just pretend, let's imagine, let's assume that you actually have a brain. And in addition, you engage it. And you're aware that these solar costs are declining and these battery costs are declining. And you think to yourself, you know what? Looks like a business opportunity. I might start a company. Next minute, Tesla. Now, conventional analyses almost always underestimate cost improvements during disruption. And you know who else loves conventional analysis? That's right, the Wall Street stock analysts who've had a sell rating on Tesla stock for the last five years. How about a nice slow clap for the Wall Street analysts who don't actually analyze, but reason by analogy. Costs improve as market supply and demand expand, and the industry learns from experience. When conventional analyses often make linear forecasts for market growth. In reality, disruption always follows an S-curve, the first phase of which is exponential. And this is what we're seeing now. The global market for each of these three technologies shows a beautifully consistent exponential curve. So why do disruptions follow an S-curve? The answer is that it's because they're driven by causal feedback loops. For any new technology, falling costs increase demand, which attracts more investment in production. That in turn expands supply and expanding supply lowers costs even further. At the same time, growing demand also triggers more infrastructure investment and government support, which also increase supply. As supply expands, the technology itself improves. The public becomes more accepting of it, and network effects emerge around leading brands and platforms, all of which drive demand growth even further. So the entire process is characterized by acceleration, with each feedback loop amplifying the others in a virtuous cycle. And at the same time, growing demand for the new reduces demand for the old. Revenues for the old technology decline, which causes supply to shrink. A smaller supply means loss of economies of scale, and so costs increase. At higher costs, which translate into higher prices, demand falls. Less demand also means less profit, less investment in production and infrastructure, less government support, all of which cause supply to contract further. Let's just take a few moments to let the implications of this sink in. Imagine you're an internal combustion engine vehicle producer, a legacy automotive manufacturer. You've got 20 or 30 different models of internal combustion engine vehicles that consumers within a few years will no longer want to buy. In fact, they just won't buy, period, because for no price, it doesn't matter how cheap they are, people are going to want an electric vehicle because of the better performance, range, lower cost of ownership, features, functionality, everything. These companies are universally f***ed. Now, yes, there'll be one or two survivors, but most won't make it. Turning a huge ship around is not a fast process. Suddenly, you've got to scale down and contract, stop producing all those internal combustion engine vehicles, and at the same time, simultaneously ramp up production of electric vehicles. All this technology needs to be developed in the meantime. This is going to be brutal, painful, and absolutely decimate the automotive industry. My expectation is that we're going to see a brutal contraction in overall sales volumes for a few years until automotive manufacturers can ramp production on electric vehicles to meet consumer demand. I'm telling you guys now, most legacy automotive manufacturers will not survive the decade. They will either go bankrupt, be acquired, or merge. It is going to be brutal. Guess who will survive the decade by eating the lunch of all these boneheaded companies who should have been moving towards electrification 10 years ago, but were too stupid to even realize that they need to do that to survive the next decade. And that's right, Tesla. And that in turn reduces public acceptance and weakens network effects. And so, for incumbents, the process is also an accelerating one, where each factor catalyzes the others. But, in this case, it's a vicious cycle of decline. And less demand for the old drives all the more demand for the new. Now, we've seen this pattern again and again for technologies of all different kinds throughout history. And in each case, the outcome is not a slow, incremental transition but rather a rapid and total transformation of the market that takes place over the course of just a decade or so. 
Now, because the rate of change is slow in the early years, it almost always takes conventional analysts and observers by surprise when disruption gets going. We have every reason to expect that this disruption of energy by solar, wind, and batteries will follow exactly this same historical pattern. Bingo. This is the core reason why most investors, most stock analysts completely miss the mark on Tesla and completely underestimate the future potential of the business. Now, I don't know how to say this gently, but the good thing is I don't actually care about being gentle. I'm not here to make you feel nice. I'm here to make you think. So get ready for this one. Every single person today who's currently investing in the stock of legacy automotive manufacturers is a straight moron. There are no exceptions. Now I know that came across as a little bit harsh, so I just want to apologize to absolutely nobody because I mean it. The history of technology shows us that the exponential growth phase tends to continue until the new technology comprises about 75% of its global market ultimate size. Now, because most disruptions make their markets expand, this means that the new technologies often grow well beyond the size of the old system. So the reason we can be so confident that the costs of solar and wind and batteries will keep falling through the 2020s is because the global markets for these technologies will continue to grow exponentially in the decade ahead. Conventional forecasts get disruption wrong. Major industry forecasts have made simple linear projections for the growth of solar, for example, year after year for 20 years. Now, at the same time that disruption creates a new system, it also wipes out the old system. And this isn't theoretical. It has already begun with coal in the United States. Year after year, these same industry forecasts have been desperately trying to save coal from collapse with wishful thinking. But coal in the United States has been disrupted, first by fracking, and now by solar and wind. Amazing visuals there. Looking at these linear forecasts versus the actual path of adoption and just every time conventional forecasts, wrong, 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 wrong. This is why stock analysts don't get it. This is why the market doesn't get it. This is why people like Kathy Wood and Tony Sieber sound like absolute morons until they don't. Solar and wind by themselves are now the cheapest way to generate electricity. And these are just global averages. In sunny places like California, it's already cheaper to build a new solar plant today than to keep operating an old coal, gas, or nuclear plant. And by 2030, it's no contest at all. So again, we are not facing a slow energy transition. We're facing a rapid and total energy transformation. And it has already begun. When we plot each viable 100% solar, wind, and battery system according to its cost and its generating capacity, a clear U-shaped pattern emerges, or more technically, a cost function that is convex shaped. Systems with lots of battery capacity, but relatively little generating capacity will work, but they'll be expensive. And the same is true for systems with lots of solar and wind, but relatively little battery capacity. So the overall relationship looks like this. And there's a cost optimal combination of solar, wind, and batteries, a sweet spot at the bottom of the U-curve and for each region, it varies with climate and geography. But what is so counterintuitive is where this sweet spot is located. It turns out that the lowest cost system will have between three and five times more generating capacity than today's grid. Because with that much solar and wind, you only need 35 to 90 hours worth of batteries, and it's the batteries that are so expensive. Okay, so shit is about to get real. The implication here is that in the future, total energy generation will be three to five times as much as it is today, predominantly through wind and solar. Shout out to Tesla Solar. Now, most conventional forecasts have never even considered building that much solar and wind capacity. But understanding disruption means rethinking the boundaries of the existing system. And when I began this research, I fully expected that some combination of solar, wind, and batteries would prove feasible. But what came as a shock to me from analyzing the clean energy U-curve is that the optimal combination, the lowest cost combination of solar and wind, is also by far the cheapest electricity system that we can build. The new system will have a completely different architecture than the old one and work in very different ways. And perhaps the most counterintuitive aspect of this is that the new system will produce much, much more electricity overall. So when we build a, a system based on solar and wind power, we have to design it to get through the worst times of year, those 
cloudy weeks of winter when the days are shortest. But by doing so, we naturally end up with the capacity to generate much more electricity on most of the other days of the year. And because it's coming primarily from the sun, it doesn't cost anything. There's no fuel. There's no additional wear and tear on the equipment. If the sun is shining, solar panels just sit there and happily make electricity. And that means that the marginal cost is effectively zero. We call this additional benefit of 100% solar wind and battery systems super power. Its implications are simply stunning. So guys, make sure you're sitting down for this. To start with, the sheer scale of superpower is enormous. In sunny regions like California and Texas, superpower output is greater than all existing electricity demand today. And what's more, superpower is not just available once in a while. It's available all year round. Even in a region like New England, superpower will be available on two thirds of all days of the year. In sunnier areas, on over 90% of all days. And remember, this is still the cheapest electricity system that we can build. So once again, conventional analyses get disruption wrong here. Today, regions like California that are early adopters of solar and wind power are already producing superpower. But the incumbents, perhaps not surprisingly, frame superpower as a problem, not as an opportunity. It's branded overproduction that must be curtailed. But anyone can see that flushing gigawatt hours of clean, nearly costless energy down the drain is no kind of solution at all. It's insanity. This irrational response is exactly the sort of behavior that emerges when an old production system cannot integrate a new technology and is therefore poised for disruption. Superpower is one of the greatest opportunities of our time. Just imagine what society could do with a huge amount of clean energy that is available almost every day and is essentially free. Well, the sky's the limit. It's enough energy to meet all water needs with treatment and desalination, or enough energy to electrify all road transportation with plenty to spare. We could use it to replace fossil fuels in most residential or commercial heating, for example, or use it in recycling and waste processing, or in heavy industry applications like smelting metals. We could even use superpower in more exotic applications like mining cryptocurrency, withdrawing carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere, or synthesizing carbon neutral fuels for special niche applications and uses. With so many potential applications, it's difficult to predict exactly how superpower will be utilized. But what we can say with confidence is that hundreds of new business models across dozens of industries will emerge to take advantage of such an extraordinary opportunity, just as they did when the internet slashed the marginal cost of communication and information to near zero. The world is about to transition into an era of energy abundance, where the marginal cost of electricity effectively falls to zero. And this is the perfect opportunity to once again remind you guys that in this investor's opinion, Tesla is gonna take an outsized share of the world's energy generation storage and supply using autobit as software and remember if the world is generating three five times as much energy in the future as it is today that means there's a much larger slice of the market available for somebody to generate store and supply that energy now there's one last fascinating twist to the story that becomes clear when we put these two key findings the clean energy u curve and superpower together superpower returns on investment are not linear. They are disproportionately large near the sweet spot on the clean energy U-curve. So on the one hand, it makes sense to minimize costs by building the least expensive electricity system possible. And that's represented by the sweet spot at the bottom of the curve. But what if a region were to make a modest additional investment of say 20%? Well, depending on geographic conditions, that could boost the system's generating capacity by 50 to 100%. And that in turn would increase its superpower output by as much as 200% for just a 20% increase in investment. In California, for example, existing electricity demand totals 285 terawatt hours each year. In the lowest cost scenario, the one at the sweet spot on California's clean energy U-curve, 
a 100% solar wind and battery system would meet all 285 terawatt hours of that existing demand, plus generate an additional 309 terawatt hours of superpower. Now here's how that compares to energy use in the rest of California's economy, the transportation sector, residential sector, commercial sector, and industrial sector. But an additional 20% investment in solar, wind, and batteries would nearly double California's superpower. So just imagine, what would your region or business do with all this superpower? In 1995, we all paid for long distance phone calls and dial up internet access by the minute. Remember that? But a decade later, bandwidth was so cheap that restaurants were giving it away for free as Wi-Fi to get customers in the door. Why not do the same with electric vehicle charging? Today, regions try to attract manufacturers and other heavy industry with tax breaks and other incentives. Why not give them free energy at certain times of day instead? And speaking of which, if energy were cheap enough, it might make sense to repatriate manufacturing. Even the manufacturing of solar panels, wind turbines, and batteries themselves right here domestically. That of course would lower their costs and accelerate the disruption even further. 100% solar, wind, and batteries will be transformative, economically, socially, and environmentally. Energy powers our farms and factories. It pumps and purifies our water. It drives our vehicles and transportation systems. It heats our homes and businesses. It illuminates our lives. And so wherever energy is utilized in abundance, prosperity has always followed. This disruption therefore offers a pathway for achieving many of our most important goals. It will create millions of new jobs and opportunities for entrepreneurship. It will reduce pollution and make communities healthier. It will help mitigate climate change. The disruption of energy is inevitable. What we need now is leadership. We need communities and policymakers and entrepreneurs and investors to understand the implications of this disruption. I for one am doing my part to try to help investors understand the implications of this disruption, hence the video so that we can act on this information by making the right choices today. That means no further investment in coal, gas, or conventional nuclear power, knowing that those assets will be stranded. It means removing barriers to solar and wind and batteries deployment by guaranteeing everyone the right to produce and trade electricity with anyone else, individuals and businesses alike. You guys hear that? By guaranteeing anyone the right to produce, AKA solar into a battery, and trade slash supply energy to anyone, AKA auto bit of software. I really truly do not think people understand the implications here. Everybody is going to become their own distributed utility. People will be generating energy on their rooftops, storing it in batteries and selling that energy to other users back to the grid, performing energy arbitrage, etc. That'll all happen automatically with software like Tesla's auto bidder. And of course, Tesla's going to take a tiny, tiny cut of all this energy movement around the planet. It means recognizing that superpower is not a problem, but is in fact one of the greatest opportunities of our time. It means realizing that near zero marginal cost electricity changes everything. And then what the internet did to information, solar, wind, and batteries are going to do to energy. That what happened in the world of bits is now about to happen in the world of electrons. What a quote. We've got to listen to that again. Brilliantly articulated. And then what the internet did to information, solar, wind, and batteries are going to do to energy. That what happened in the world of bits is now about to happen in the world of electrons. It means understanding that we're not facing a slow incremental energy transition, but that this is a disruption and it has already begun. I hope you guys have found this video insightful. I really, really am doing my best to try to help open the eyes of investors to understand the imminent disruption that's taking place. Internal combustion engine vehicles are fucked. Legacy automotive manufacturers are fucked. Power plant operators are fucked. Utilities are fucked. This disruption is going to take place faster than anyone expects and have far wider reaching implications than anyone could possibly imagine. Trillions of dollars of market capitalization are going to evaporate in the stock market in the next five to 10 years, but there's going to be even greater opportunities for companies that have the brains, engineering talent, leadership, and technology to take advantage of this transition towards batteries, solar, and electric vehicles. My words of advice to stock investors are quite simple. 
Don't be on the wrong side of this inevitable change. And speaking of stock investors, if there was only one company you could invest in to take advantage of this seismic disruption, what would that company be? Let me know in the comments below. I'm Stephen Mark Ryan. This is Solving the Money Problem and I love you all. And don't forget, if you live in the US and you'd like to help out the channel and get up to four free stocks, check out the link in the description to Weeble. If you open a new account, you'll get two free stocks between $2.50 and $250 each just for opening an account. And if you deposit $100, you'll get a further two free stocks valued between $8 and $1,600 each. And if you're in Australia, the UK or New Zealand, you can get a free stock with stake also using the link in the description. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And of course, if you have any ideas for future videos, let me know. I read all your comments. P.S. If you're still watching, you're awesome. If you'd like early access, exclusive videos, regular Q&As, our private Discord server and more, consider supporting the channel at patreon.com slash solving the money problem so i can keep creating content for you guys there's a link in the description you can now also become a member of the channel for some exclusive perks to learn more click the join button next to subscribe and don't forget to check out our merch store either way the best form of support is you being here and watching so thanks again